All right, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. We're trying something a little bit different. Uh, it's not going to be quite as heavy with the screen sharing stuff, but we are just going to show some photos and talk about it. So uh, I think a lot of people are curious sometimes about what goes on behind the camera and more so what goes into creating some of these different photos that you see all the time. Um, so that's what we're here to do tonight. Uh, I have six great friends and we're going to share a bunch of different photos and tell the story. Some are going to be funny, some are a lot of hard work, and sometimes it's just luck. So we have a good mix of everything and we'll kind of just get started right away. I'm going to kind of kick it off with the first photo here and definitely give us questions as you guys have any in the comments and we'll make sure that uh, whoever's talking about their photo answers it. So. I'm going to kick it off here with this American Flamingo I photographed down in Fort Myers, Florida. So this was actually a really rare bird for the area. They are normally not found this far north, even in Florida. They're kind of rare even all the way down south in the Keys. So uh, it was really odd how I actually found out about this bird. I was staying at my in-laws right near Fort Myers and they just had the local news on and a story came on about this Flamingo. So. I actually found out about this bird even being there through the local news, which is kind of an odd way for a wildlife photographer to find out that a rare bird is in the area. Um, so that, that right there kind of started off an odd series of events. Uh, but I did know the location uh, because I had been there a couple days prior. So I packed up one afternoon and drove myself out to, this was actually at Bunch Beach in North Fort Myers, Florida. And when I first arrived, I'm actually going to switch to a different photo here just to show you guys. When I first arrive, I walk, I park, I walk out to the shoreline, and this is what I see. This American Flamingo, just one by itself, standing way, way out in the bay. I think I estimated probably about 200, 250 feet off the shore, and it looks like it's standing way out in the middle of the water, and there is, the light is just horrible. It's like glaring, bright sun and nothing really looks great at that point. Uh, thankfully I had been there a couple days prior like I mentioned so I knew that this entire bay even at high tide like this was really shallow so I actually was able to walk around so I actually took it took me about I think 20 minutes or so uh, maybe even 30 minutes to slowly walk around and put myself on the other side of this bird so I had good light and um, so the way I was shooting this was I actually waded in just about waist deep in the water. I had my monopod with the 500 millimeter mounted on top of that and I was using my right angle viewfinder so I could actually keep the camera lower than where I was standing and just kind of look down and get a nice low perspective. Um, these waves definitely look a little bit larger than they were. Uh, the bird, it's definitely a larger bird but it's not that big and uh, these small waves were just kind of breaking on this little sandbar that it was standing on it was kind of getting beat up. Uh, but it was an incredible experience and I actually was just just I was the only one out there and I got to stand out there for about 45 minutes just me and this bird just hanging out and uh, taking all these photographs of uh, a pretty much a nice rarity in Florida so uh, that was my story there for that photo and we're gonna move on to the next one here and this one is Adam with a solo owl so hand it off to you Adam all right so uh Here's a, a golden solid owl. Um, this photo, um, this this story is is a learning experience. It's a it's got some comedy value to it. Um, last this uh, story took place December thirtieth, so almost exactly one year ago. I'd never seen a solid before. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Pacific Northwest where I live, the uh, Washington and Oregon are kind of uh, split with the Cascade Mountains. So on the west side, you have temperate rainforests and lush green valleys in the coast. And on the east side, you have uh, pine forests in the mountains and a lot of uh, high desert and shrub steppe. So in the wintertime, um, you have sawwets that uh, migrate down to lower elevations and then um, other migrants. So. It's a, it's a really good place to go look for these birds, and uh, if you've never seen one before, they're about seven or eight inches. They're really, really small yeah, they're dainty. Tiny guys. And uh, they have um, a, a knack for just tucking themselves into the tiniest little nook. So to, to find one, you have to kind of understand um, where they like to hide. So I've never seen one before. I drove out four hours. 
and I showed up at this park where right along the Snake River, um, it's a pretty good spot to find them. Some years you'll have five or six um, in this tiny little park. And so I show up and I just I just kind of just start looking and I'm looking under big dug furs. Um, I'm looking for the bird, but I'm also looking for whitewash, pellets, any any kind of sign that will tell me that there's one in the area. And so um, I'm looking for about 20 minutes and I'm a lot of whitewash. It's, it's really owly, as they say. I, I found a dead barn owl from a, a great horned owl. Um, pellets and whitewash everywhere. And I'm not turning up a saw wet, though. So I keep looking, and there's about a 40-yard row of little tiny um, conifer kind of hedge-looking things, um, little manicured things. And there's probably about 20 of them. And I start looking at those and I'm looking, I'm looking, there's whitewash under a lot of them, still can't find a bird. Uh, I come up to one that's pretty big, it's actually two that are growing together and there's whitewash just hammered on the underneath. And so I do a perimeter sweep and I'm going around and I'm looking in every single little nook that I can possibly get my eyes on, nothing. And the understory is about four feet high, so I, I just kind of duck under and I'm looking underneath, and I'm looking and I'm looking, and I know what I'm looking for, but I don't yet fully understand what I'm looking at because I've never seen one before. And until you see a bird like a sawwet, you just you don't get it. So I, I give up on that, um, and I, I move on. I, I can't find anything. And at this point, I'm, I'm getting kind of discouraged. I'm, I'm I think I'm doing everything I can. I'm seeing a lot of signs. There's just, there's not a whole lot of uh, hope at this point. So, um, and I'm out in the middle of nowhere, by the way. So I'm the only one there. Um, there's, there's nobody else. It's just me and this little park. And I, I go on, I'm looking under um, more mature conifers, uh, predominantly duck furs. And I get to a point where I'm just kind of scratching my head and I, I really don't know what more I can do. And so I end up going back to this one tiny little, um, this tiny little conifer in this row, because I'm just, it, it had so much uh, sign of an owl that something just told me that I, I just needed to go back and look uh, for a second time. So I do another quick perimeter sweep, not much hope there. And this time I, I duck under and I actually stand almost all the way up inside of this uh, this little uh, bush type thing. And so my head is, um, you can see the photo, it's really, really sticky and dense. And so my, my the brim of my cap is kind of brushing up against it. And I'm looking around and I don't see anything. I'm looking in every little nook and I'm just kind of standing there. And without turning my torso, I just kind of crane my head back 180 degrees and no more than eight inches from my face, I just see these two big bulging eyes. And the first thing I did was I just ducked. I ducked so hard that my knees slammed to the ground and I just kind of curled up in the fetal position because it Hilarious. scared me. <laughs> and so if you can imagine seeing someone inside of a bush and then just falling over uh, out of sheer terror. Um, and, and so I'm sitting there and I just kind of, I roll over on my back and I just look straight up and there's just this sawwet just staring at me, scared to death. So, um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. So it, it, it's funny. It's also a learning experience that you, you shouldn't go put in your face and, uh, and yeah. saw, sorry, just a little disclaimer. The photo you're looking at is actually a photo that I took last week. Um, I shared this photo because, it's it's much better it's still a little sticky and dense but this photo was taken in the exact same bush no no more than a foot away from that saw wet last year oh that's wild so man the photo the photo last year was uh looking straight up and the poor little guy's eyes were just bugging out of its head nice. and it's not good it's really obstructed so this one's just better to look at but again i mean this is you know and at that point i realized this this is what they're capable of because this one is a little less obstructed, but the one last year, he was tucked up and stuff that I don't even know how he got into. 
So that's wild. Uh, it was, you know, for my life first saw what, you know, the first one I ever saw and found on my own. And uh, at the end of the day, it was a grown man zero northern solid owl one. There you go. That's perfect, man. Hey, thanks for sharing that story. That's a great one. And uh, I have a quick question for you. So now that you have experience finding more of these types of owls, um, what do you think? How come that owl didn't flush when you stood up in its bush like that? Is that kind of normal behavior for them when they're on a roost like this? To just stay put? Yes. That's extremely normal, and that's kind of the misconception that sawwets are tame, and that it's okay to get close to them because their their primary line of defense is to just stay still. Okay. And that's why they're so rarely seen. So, the first thing that you see when a sawwet's scared is its eyes bug out of its head. Gotcha. Which is exactly what this one was doing because I had a human human head. Yeah. Less than a foot. <laughs> so you know it was it was a learning experience. You know now I know that you you have to be careful. And um, just because they will allow you to get close doesn't mean that you should. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I laid there on my back, kind of, kind of chuckling to myself. Took a couple of pictures and let it be, but definitely um, a moment that I'll never forget, and and probably the funniest thing that'll ever happen to me with wildlife. That's awesome, man. I love when those uh, those moments in wildlife photography that that create that memory that you'll never forget and then uh to just have that photo to always bring you back there even if you do forget all the memories come rushing back so uh, thanks for sharing great and then uh real quick yeah uh, a couple questions um pete asked how big i think sawwets are about seven or eight inches so the best guy usually describe to people is they're they're about the size of a coffee cup maybe a little taller but a little slimmer um so really really small and then i did not use flash Okay, so, cool. Yeah, it definitely looks naturally lit this, on this one. I think this was uh, one fifteenth of a second or somewhere in that range at nice. ISO 1600 on a tripod. Awesome. Yeah, you can see the giant catch lights from the only light source coming from underneath. So, nice. All right, cool. Let's uh, move right on. Um, let's see. Next up, we have Karam here with this uh, awesome moose in the snow. So, Karam, take it away. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, we decided, a friend of mine and myself that we wanted to go photograph moose in the rut and from our research apparently it was going to be very easy we're going to fly to Yellowstone shoot them out of our car window and we got there and believe it or not there was not a single animal in Tetons uh, we asked around and everybody said well you know this year the migration is just late so they're not here yet uh, we tried to make the best of it and uh, you know, try to find whatever we could. Uh, one morning we decided to go look for moose. Uh, we had a general idea where they were gonna be. As we woke up, we got onto the road. It was a foggy night, it was snowing. You could barely see more than two feet ahead of you. So, you know, how I got this image has to do a lot of, with luck, a lot with uh, endurance and a lot with stability. Uh, when we got to the area, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a young moose cross the road. We stopped uh, and we decided that we're gonna follow it. Uh, for people who've been in sagebrush, uh, sagebrush is weird in the sense that it will suck you in. Like no matter what you do, it is hard to walk this uh, kind of uh, environment. I had my uh, 600 on my shoulder and we decided to keep uh, uh, in at least, uh, you know, viewing distance of the moose, I was going in some direction. Uh, I walked in this literally for 30 minutes, uh, huffing and puffing, and finally realizing that I was in bear country and I had left my bear spray in the car. Uh, oh well, you know, <laughs> but the moose was going somewhere. Uh, and finally, you know, in this panic, I slipped. Uh, every part of my body went down. I somehow managed with one hand to keep my 600 up in the air. So uh, nothing was lost, just a little battered, and then we kept following the moose uh, to realize that he was actually chasing a female. The problem was the female was already taken by this guy, who was probably eight feet, weighed close to 2,000 pounds, and then they started fighting. Uh, or at least trying to attempt to fight, but the younger moose decided that, no, he wasn't a match for this guy and decided to take up shelter behind us. So in the midst of it all, I have this guy in front of me, the youngest moose behind me, 
and it, and this move starts sort of charging. I took a few shots, and then I realized, okay, you can pretty much die here. And I looked around to see where the closest uh, tree was, uh, and I was luckily able to get behind that, and the moose stopped its charge, and I was able to walk away with a couple of frames of this guy in the sagebrush during the snow, and that was more than what I was planning on doing. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, the, the image is really amazing there. And, uh, you know, that's the funny thing, too. I, I think you see a photo like this and you kind of have no idea of all the uh, steps and, and craziness in this case that you went through just to get that. So uh, Yeah, everyone I've spoken to told me, oh, you'll be fine. We'll just shoot them out of your car yeah. window. <laughs> that, that'll be, we, you know, we literally, 30 minutes and that sagebrush, People who are from the area know of the walk at Sandy Hook. Trust me, Sandy Hook yeah. is like going to the spa oh, and nice. this walking abyss. Yeah, I've certainly never been in any terrain like that, uh, but it does look amazing. You know, it makes for a really great photo, that's for sure. All right, thanks, thanks Pete. Yeah, All thanks, right. thanks so much. All right, let's move on to the next one. Next up, we have Josh Galicki with this lovely shoveler. So, all you, Josh. Hey, thanks, Ray. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, so far we had flamingos on the beach in Florida, sawets and bushes in the Pacific Northwest, charging moose in Yellowstone, and I present to everybody a northern <laughs> shoveler in a park pond. <laughs> 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 and I, so really, you know, most good shots are usually a result of good planning. Um, very rarely will you see a shot that was a, a pure accident. Uh, the moral of this story, I think, is that execution of some shots can be a lot easier than others. Actually, when I took this shot, and literally I had a suit on, um, wingtips, and I had a cup of tea that I bought from Starbucks a few minutes before. That's so the great. Toughest thing, yeah, the, the toughest thing about this shot, my necktie kept flying up in front of my face when I was trying to Every get wild, well, wildlife photographer's worst nightmare. Uh, how about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Ducks are interesting because if you try to shoot ducks in um, areas where there's hunting and the like, they're used to guns going off. They're very, very skittish. Shovelers are very, very skittish usually. However, when I try to um, photograph ducks, I look for areas that have a lot of folks and pe or people walking around it. They're used to people. Um, uh, public parks and, and ponds near parks are great opportunities for that. There's this one um, place I discovered a few years ago, and I checked to see if uh, some of the ducks were back, shovelers are there, in, in addition to some other species, and sure enough, they were there. So when I would wrap up work during the week, I'd drive over to the pond, get out, walk up to the pond, lay down, put my lens on the ground, there you go. And, and just shoot away. This uh, was just when the sun was setting, actually, and uh, there was still some uh, foliage up on the trees, and got some great autumn reflection there. It lit up gold. It was kind of, it all came together pretty easy for me. But I think, you know, again, the moral of the story is not all shots um, require camo, wading through mud, um, crawling through sand. Some shots are as easy as just getting out of the car and laying down and having a, a sip of tea and taking a shot. So um, you never know where you're going to find wildlife. And, you know, sometimes it's easier than others. So that's the Northern Shoveler. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot, and, um, you know, it's not just as simple as you made it sound, too. You put in the time of, you know, scouting the location and researching it and knowing where they would be, most likely when they would be there, light direction, stuff like that. So I know that uh, just the way you shoot a little bit more went into it as well, but, yeah, it's a great point. It doesn't always have to be the most crazy, you know, in-depth outing to get some great images. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, sure thing. All right, next up, let's see what we got here. Oh, yeah. Tyler with this awesome bobcat. Let's hear the story. All right, hey, everybody. Um, so I want to start off talking, Josh just mentioned about you know, how a lot of wildlife photos are, um, are good planning <laughs> versus pure accident. And this bobcat was absolutely pure accident. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, I, I've spent a lot of time in Shenandoah National Park. I live down in Virginia. Um, and especially starting last year, um, I started going out there probably at least once or twice, um, maybe sometimes twice a week, um, usually a number of times a month. 
uh, mostly looking for black bears to photograph. Uh, last year was a, was a massive year for black bears in, in Shenandoah National Park. Um, and I think in total I saw probably well over 50 in the number of trips that I was out there. Um, what I was always hoping to see on my times out there was a bobcat. And I knew that that seeing one was going to be almost impossible because they're they're very spooky creatures. They're uh, they're not seen very much during the day. They kind of hunt at nighttime and wander around. And, and if you do get lucky enough to see one, it's usually you catch it out of the corner of your eye as it's darting across Skyline Drive or running ahead of you and down a trail if you're hiking. So one morning, uh, late in the fall of uh, 2016, last year, I was uh, you know doing my normal thing, driving Skyline Drive, and I got out there um, right around sunrise. Uh, so I had to leave my apartment in Virginia very early in the morning. I got left probably around 5 a.m., maybe even earlier than that, uh, to get out there at sunrise. And uh, I had gotten down to Big Meadows, if any of you are familiar with uh, Shenandoah National Park, and I was down there just kind of looking around to see if there were any uh, deer around because it was just finishing up with the rut um, so there was still some buck around here and there so I took some time uh, looked around the meadow and then I decided well I'll have, I didn't really see a whole lot so I'll continue driving south a little bit uh, so I went south of Big Meadows and as I came around a turn I just I see this object in the middle of the road and and immediately I, I, I saw it, I was like, what is that? And all of a sudden it just clicked and I was like, oh my God, it's a bobcat. <laughs> and Now what? So, yeah, exactly. Now what? I'm, I'm in my car, you know, I'm coming around this turn and I have I have my camera attached to my 100 to 400 sitting next to me, which wasn't even ideal. I, I should have had my 500 on. Um, but so I'm like, do I, do I stop? Do I try to get out and approach it? I have no idea what I'm doing. So... I basically like slow down as much as I can. Of course, my brakes are squealing, and I'm like, ah, this is gonna, you know, it's gonna scare this thing away. Um, it didn't somehow. So as I get closer, and I'm slowing, 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 this bobcat just kind of meanders off to the side of the road, um, and he looks back at me, and I basically end up parked um, across both lanes of Skyline Drive with my windows down, nice. and this bobcat is now just hopped up onto the side of the road. And it's just sitting there staring at me. And as, as you can imagine, um, I am shaking like mad because I've, I've never seen one of these before and l let alone had it close enough to get a photo of. Um, so there I am parked across both lanes of Skyline Drive and I'm just thinking to myself, please nobody come down through here and scare this thing away. So I'm just clicking away, clicking, clicking, clicking my camera. And it just it kind of sits there. And finally, after about maybe 10 shots, it gets up and walks down the the road a little bit further and I just kind of slowly I let my brake off and just kind of let the car roll down <laughs> skyline a little bit um, and it, it meanders behind a couple trees um, the shot that you're seeing here on the screen was one of the very first ones that I got actually and somehow ended up you know decent enough to, to turn into a usable photo um, despite all of, despite all of my shaking yeah um, the Bobcat ended up you know coming down basically sitting next to the road um, I got a number of photos. Of it. I took probably 200, 250 photos of it um, in the time I had with it. Eventually, I was able to kind of meander my car uh, into a parking area that's was very conveniently located right next to where this thing came out. Uh, so I parked my car and I hopped out, and it actually walked back around to where it initially was and just sat down and stared at me. And I, I walked over to the road and I sat there and I took a couple more pictures of it. Um, and this whole thing, it probably lasted maybe five minutes. It felt like, you know, 10 seconds because it was just yeah. so ridiculous. Um, and uh, eventually it went up the hill. And I, I ran back to my car and switched onto my 500. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm just beside myself. I can't believe what I just saw. Um, and it ended up coming back a second time. I didn't really get any great shots of it then. But all in all, I think... I was there for probably about 20 minutes watching it, and that entire time, not a single other car came through, um, which, if you've ever driven Skyline, is, is almost impossible. So, like I was saying, you know, planning versus pure luck, and or pure accident and luck, like, this was absolutely pure accident and luck, um, and it just couldn't have worked out any better. Um, it was just, it, it's an experience that I will never forget. I was, I, I 
it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome, man. One of the uh, commenters also mentioned the eye contact, and I totally agree. The eye contact you have in the shot is incredible, and uh, you, you know man. how nice of it to sit on that rock with all the uh, right. lovely color and texture on it <laughs> right. too. Uh, and then I also want to, you know, just reiterate something you mentioned in the beginning. You kind of just passed over it, but you had said, you know, how many times you had gone out there. So uh, definitely right. the luck here, but the time spent in the field is what you put in in order to Absolutely. be there and get lucky enough to get the shot. So, Absolutely. All right, cool. Thanks so much, Tyler. Great shot. Hey, Great story. Thanks. All right, let's see. What do we got next? Uh, here we go. Scott Key is going to finish this up here with this incredible shot. Let, let us uh, hear this story, Scott. Yeah, so I, I did two shots. So the first one is a little bit about luck and um, kind of being prepared. So I'm driving in a car. We've got a local duck pond. Uh, this was actually one of the first photos that I, I I can say I was like proud of or it, it kind of moved me. So I'd been taking, um, I've been doing bird photography for about a year, really studying behavior of birds and learning locations and just trying to figure out what really worked. So I'm headed to this duck pond and I'm dri driving down the road and I see a robin fly right in front of the car and not five seconds or, or half a second later, this, this sharp-shinned hawker flies right in front of the windshield. It almost hit, they both almost hit the car. Um, so I, I stopped the car, there was nobody on the road, I got out and I'm expecting it to perch on the side of the road and um, maybe get some photos if I'm lucky. Um, they swoop back around right toward the car again and I watch a sharp-shinned hawk take the robin, which I've never seen, it's the only time I've ever seen it in my life, but take it in midair, um, grab it in its talons, and bring it to the ground. It's literally 15 feet in front of me at this point. I am shaking. And um, it, it was a, it I was shaking for a couple reasons. One, I couldn't believe that this was happening in front of me. But two, there was this whole scene playing out, and it was this life and death struggle. Um, there was a part of me that wanted to like, go in and grab the robin and save its life. It was already done. And he, the sharp shin, and if you guys know or watch raptors at all, when they're on prey, first of all, we, we don't normally want to disrupt a raptor on prey. In this case, I got lucky it actually landed in front of me with prey. But um, they're not going to leave until that thing's dead. He wasn't going to flush or run away until he was sure that he had his meal. So I was really lucky in that sense. Um, I took uh, probably 50 to 100 frames in a short period of time before he flew off with the robin. I chose this one frame and I actually titled it Mercy. It almost looks as though he's begging for his life. Yeah, and it really um, yeah, it was really powerful. So a couple things happened after I took the image and he flew off. It, it, it almost shook me a little bit like watching something right in front of you die something you like I, I like birds I love songbirds. Um, but then it also makes you think about if he doesn't eat he dies and so there was that part of it. Um, the other part of the story is this was early on again, like I just started taking pictures and having some success. And I remember when I shared this on social media for the first time, uh, back then I used to get like <laughs> two or three notifications that somebody liked one of my pictures. So I probably left my the buzzer on my phone on and all of a sudden my phone just kept going and buzzing and I got all these notifications and all these people um, responding to it. So I think that was a little addictive as well, just kind of seeing the impact that you can have when, you know, 500 people on Facebook tell you that they love your picture or that what is really powerful or moved them. So it was a little bit of dumb luck. I did have my camera on the seat, so a little bit of preparation, always being ready, um, but always um, kind of knowing that anything can happen at any time. And if you're prepared and have the gear with you, uh, it certainly helps you out. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing. And yeah, just... The way that the robin's head is like kind of looking up there just it just that really is what makes the shot there too so yeah love it um all right cool uh we actually made it through once for everybody um and i think we made pretty good time here so i think we're going to try and go through a second round of photos we each have two photos to talk about tonight so um you know guys please feel free to ask questions in the comments and we're going to go through another round of photos here uh, pretty quick and these are all going to have a little bit of a different story so we should hopefully find out some more interesting stuff so let's see what we got up next uh back to karam here with this uh what is it is this a red-throated it's a red-throated there you go all right take it away all right i am uh among the crew i guess probably the guy who likes to photograph birds the least. Uh, 
but you know, I wanted to photograph the Northern Diver, and I had this image in mind. Only problem is uh, this kind of behavior is very far from where I live. Uh, so basically, it involved some planning. Uh, it involved a lot of flying. I flew from here to Seattle. Uh, I wish I'd known Adam then, but uh, this was last year. Uh, from Seattle to Anchorage, from Anchorage to Fairbanks, from Fairbanks to Prudhoe Bay, from Prudhoe Bay to Barrow. Oh, is that all? After, after the, about 36 hours, we did reach Barrow. Um, and over the next couple of days, we spent looking for various birds. Uh, this particular loon, uh, we found out, was nesting in one direction about three miles off the road. And trekking again in the tundra is not easy. We finally got, we found them on the nest. Uh, Red-throated loons don't always sit on nests, especially if it's warm, they'll go off the nest. This was a particularly, uh, you know, uh, warm uh, summer uh, by their standards. So the loons were away and we got into a hide and then started the waiting game. Uh, we were in waiters. Uh, we waited for about a good 45 minutes, felt way more than that, before the loon actually showed up. And the image I had in mind, I had known that once they got onto the nest, they'll rotate their egg before they settle down. And that's when I got the shot. Um, you know, I guess a lot of people who know us photographers know we can be crazy in what we want to do. For sure. Uh, so that's the story behind that loon. Um, Pete is asking, yes, is. Are, are the eggs the bird is tending? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, uh, how did you know about that egg turning behavior? Where did you learn that? Because that was something I wasn't familiar with. Uh, basically, what I did was I, you know, before heading to Barrow, I looked up the main species I was going to photograph, and I went to the Audubon site and just read up on them. Okay. And so, you know, the loons generally, when they come and go, I saw a couple of videos. Every time I noticed, they come, they flip the egg. Oh, wow. And then they sit on top of it, whether that's a male or the female. Uh, and that's, you know, that's kind of the image I wanted sure. when it's flipping. Because once they're done flipping, they're just sitting there. Yeah. Yeah, they're just sitting there. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely great behavior and like another, another nice tender moment between, you know, even though the egg isn't alive, we know exactly what's happening there. So, yeah, yeah, awesome Pete, story, man. Being in a blind helps. What's that? Oh, Pete was asking, uh, it's super close. I'm like, yeah, being in a blind definitely helps. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's what gives you that natural behavior, right? So this bird, if you're sitting out in the open, even if it maybe accepts your presence a lot of the times, yeah. it may not perform its natural behavior like that, and it's going to be a little wary to do things and always going to be on edge, uh, where it, when you're in a complete blind and it has no clue you're there, you get this completely exactly. natural behavior, so... Awesome. Um, well, just a word of advice, if you're going to be waiting, waiters for a long time, please go use the bathroom prior. Never I learned that this year myself, yeah. <laughs> I was with you when that happened, Ray. <laughs> yep, you were. Yeah, I didn't know if I was going to make it out of that one, but I did, thankfully. So, um, Dave asks, what's right, the best way to guys. expose a white bird? Um, you know what, Dave? I'm actually going to refer you to uh, one of our recorded videos that Josh and I did where we completely discuss exposure theory and everything, and I think that will really cover it for you. So uh, if you aren't able to find it, just shoot me a message, and I'll send you the link on that just because that's a little bit uh, of kind of down a, another path here. So um, I'll just kind of answer that question that way. All right, let's see. I think this is Tyler again, right, with the red fox? Yep, that's yep. me. All right, cool, yeah. It, it's all you. That's a beautiful shot, by the way. Thank you. So this, in, in contrast to the uh, bobcat photo being pure accident, this was the, the planning shot for me. Um, I, I had been shooting down at a, a place called Occoquan Bay, um, which is a national wildlife refuge uh, here in Virginia. Um, that I, I frequented there probably since 2012 when I really first started getting into um, wildlife photography. And when I first started going there, um, it had an abundance of red foxes. In fact, I would see them almost every time I went, um, which was usually multiple times per month, um, sometimes multiple times per week because it was so close to me. 
Um, uh, and I would see these red foxes, and I would try to get pictures of them. And sometimes I was successful, and I would get some decent shots. And uh, many other times they would catch me as I was coming up a trail, and they would go running off. Um, but so it came to, I think this was in 2013 or 2014, one of those two, um, in the winter, I had decided that I really, really wanted to get a picture of a red fox in the snow because I just thought that this contrast um, between, you know, this nice bright orange animal and snow on the ground would be really pretty. I completely agree. So I, <laughs> I spent... I don't even know how many hours uh, down at that refuge that winter trying to capture a photo like this. Um, and I was down there, you know, multiple mornings per week before going into work. Thankfully, my job at the time, um, a job that I have now, they were both very flexible in hours. Um, so I was able to get there before I would go to work in the morning and spend a couple hours looking. Um, and finally, very late that winter, I think this was probably the very last snowfall we had that winter. Um, I was walking down the trail, and as I was coming down through, I, I noticed up ahead that probably it was probably a good 150 yards ahead of me, um, right around one of the turns, a, a um, great blue heron took off and seemed to have been spooked. And that was odd to me because as far as I could tell, there was really no one else out there. And typically I'm trying to, you know, when I'm out walking, I'm in tune to that type of thing. So when I saw this great blue heron spook, I was like, that's interesting. I wonder if something's coming. So I immediately kind of crouched down and just got got off to the side of the trail. And sure enough, within 30 seconds, this fox comes walking down the trail. And similar to the bobcat situation, my heart started pounding and I started shaking because I could see this scene setting up in front of me. Um, and he came walking down the trail and he was zigzagging back and forth with his nose to the ground, you know, trying to find food. And the trail was right along a bay, so he was kind of walking out to the bay, looking along the water to see what was going on, and then he'd cut back onto the trail again. And I just sat there as still as I could, um, and eventually he got within probably less than 50 yards, maybe 40. Um, and he came up, and he turned, and just he looked right at me, and I was just sitting there, you know, and I don't even know if I was wearing camo at the time. Nice. Um, I snapped a couple shots, and as you can kind of see, his back leg there is kind of crooked a little. I mean, yeah. it's up a little bit. Um, I actually think it may have been injured. Um, oh, really? Possibly, okay. yeah, which is unfortunate. Sure. Um, but yeah, he ended up. He looked at me, and he kind of he stared at me for a couple seconds. I probably got three or four frames. Thankfully, they were sharp, and then That's he all you took need off in the woods. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Um, and I just, I really ended up loving this shot because of the way it, uh, it all came together with the snow there. And you had the kind of the little, you know, I call them gumballs that are there on the ground. Yeah, those are nice, yeah. Adding adding a little extra texture. The light is just um, superb, too. Yep, it was it was great light. You get the sparkling off the snow. In the um, eyes, so yeah. It was, yeah, yeah it, was, it was just a it was perfect situation. And I, I was so excited to end the winter that way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I love when... It's so funny, I should say, sometimes how, you know, sometimes hours, days, weeks of planning go into just, like you said, you know, three or five images, you know, it's just yep. that short, yep. super short period of time, but you get that shot and that's what you want and that's what you walk away with. So it makes it all worth exactly. it. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks again. Sure. Adam, you're back up. Look at this great gray. All right. So um, this photo was taken... Uh, last spring on May 21st and um, basically uh, in early April uh, my friend and I went out to northeastern Oregon um, there's a really healthy breeding population of great grays uh, that breed in the open ponderosa pine forest and we went out and we scouted out uh, four nests that we knew of uh, just to see if they were active and then we returned in late May, which is kind of the, the go-to time for when babies fledge. Um, nothing's, nothing's certain in wildlife, so it was kind of a roll, a roll of the dice. Um, but we, so we had two, two nests that we were uh, focused on. Uh, the first nest was in uh, a row of ponderosas in a drainage ditch that were flanked by two open meadows, uh, perfect for hunting. So we spent a lot of the, the good light portions of the day uh, there. And then uh, this nest um, that you're looking at, this is um, right right near a nest site. 
was in a really, really dense kind of uh, 75 by 75 yard stretch of pines on a slope. So when you walked into it, you were almost walking into a different world. It was it was really kind of uh, cool just That's walking awesome, in there, man. and the lights just kind of uh, blacked out. So um, if you guys tuned in to the last talk, I think Josh talked about that purgatory light. You yes. know, in the middle of the day, this this photo was taken at like 11:30 a.m. maybe. Nice. Um, Sweet. In late May, so, but. But all bets are off when you're in the forest. I mean, it, it yep. can really produce some, some interesting lighting effects. So um, the story is we, we got finished up at the first nest, and we uh, we drove over on you know primitive forest service roads. We're out in the middle of nowhere. There's not another human for 10 miles. And we pull up, and we walk uh, you know 50 yards through a little meadow, and we start to hear um, her contact call. So a great, great contact call is a really low ascending um, single note uh, call. So they do that um, in breeding season. They talk to each other like that. And uh, we walked in and we knew where the nest was already, obviously. And we walked in and um, maybe 30 yards in front of us, uh, she was just perched up. Um, she was on a slope, so the slope's going down. So we're just above eye level. This, this, uh, this, um, broken top here is probably six feet off the ground and she's calling um maybe one call every 30 seconds and um it wasn't long before we realized after watching her 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 eyes are, are skyward she's looking straight up at the nest and all three of her babies are still in the nest oh wow so so we're 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 watching her and we're we're uh, popping some shots and uh Basically, the photograph, the the sun is hitting her directly. It looks like a spotlight. So yeah, it really does. You know, this this is edited. Like I, I definitely darkened up the background a little bit, but the the light is just hitting her right in the face, and it just created this this beautiful like otherworldly scene. And um, this was taken at 330 mil, uh, no crop, so really just right there. But the the story is she's she's looking up and her. She's, she's giving that call every 30 seconds or so. And we look up at the nest and we start to see these tiny little wings just struggling. You see a wing flap and you can tell that a baby is, is trying to pull itself to the edge of the nest. And so we're, we're sitting there and we're, we're looking up at the nest, we're looking at her. And you know every 30 seconds, she's, she's given a, a note. And then finally, after about 20 or 25 minutes, the baby finally struggles to get up to the edge of the nest and then her calls get louder and they get more frequent. She's calling about every 10 seconds now and, and they're loud and they're prominent and the baby finally gets up to the edge of the nest and no more than 20 seconds later, it just, it, it falls, it jumps, which is completely normal for great grays yeah. or strix owls in general. Um, they, they fledge and they just, they fall to the ground. So it was, it was such a special moment to walk in just and really dumb luck to be that good of timing, just to yeah. walk in and see the entire thing unfold, um, her calling her babies out of the nest. And, um, and that baby just, it fell like a rock. And if I was a better photographer and a little bit more prepared, I probably would have got a shot, but <laughs> I was at a bad, I was at a bad angle and I had no idea how hard it was going to fall. Sure. You know, it's probably probably in the air for two seconds wow and um it fell with the tree so i got a bunch of frames of the tree in focus and a nice. blurry baby. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> but um it you know i had no idea that um that you know that that's something that maybe a wildlife biologist studying great grays would see um spending that much time sure. but but to, to be there when that happened i mean um i've had a lot of special moments but that was i don't i don't know that i'll ever top yeah seeing that's incredible that unfold so yeah for sure that was definitely a special moment a uh, wonderful backstory man and uh an amazing image you walked away with from it so thanks for sharing thank you scott got this kinglet here super close yeah how'd you make that happen <laughs> so there's a couple things about this story one is i actually have a much 
better story that it's the worst day of my life um, with photography. I was with Ray. Um, it's the <laughs> yeah. day that I. <laughs> it's the Not day that I yeah, dunked yeah. all my equipment, and uh, it cost me a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, so my 500 that I normally shoot with was in the shop. Um, I had I had purchased a 300 2.8 lens earlier, um, so I was playing around um, before my 500 got toasted. I was playing around with the 300 2.8. Um, and one of the things about the 300 is it has a six foot minimum focusing distance versus the 500, which is at 12 feet. Yeah. And it provides some really interesting things. So while my 500 was away in the shop, I kind of committed an entire um, month to say, this is my goal. And uh, so this shot is all about having a vision and a goal. So from September 1st through the middle of October, I shoot almost exclusively in a couple places, and one of them is at a ridge that's near me. So I'm a, I'm a birder, and I like to hawk watch. Um, sometimes I'll invite Ray or Mark up to the hawk watch, and they'll be like, yeah, once uh, enough. you mean the place where the place where we go for five hours and look at birds from two miles away? Uh, and I'm like, yeah, and they're like, no thanks, I'm busy. So it's, but but I love going up there. And having gone there for five years and having gone so frequently, I'll be up there two to three mornings um, in that six weeks time period and having gone there so much, I, I started to observe other things besides hawks. So one of the things I noticed is there's a certain time of the morning where migrating songbirds would come through and they seem to just follow this pattern. So they follow the ridge and they feed along the ridge and they would bounce into the same spots over and over and over again. So this season, what I thought is I'm going to try to get a unique image for me. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to get it as close as possible with a shorter lens. So this was, again, a 300 with a teleconverter. So I'm shooting it uh, 420 millimeters F4. And I, I, I would literally sit on a rock over and over and over three to four times a week and wait for a bird to jump onto a set of branches that was right in front of me. Now, kinglets and warblers, they move pretty quick, especially when they're migrating. All they care about is feeding. And if there's not food in front of them, they're going to move on. Yep. So these aren't calling for mates. They're not. It's not a behavior that they're going to set up a territory. All they care about is getting fuel. So I had a couple chances on these perches, and I, I they were just too fast. I would miss them. But on this specific morning, the, the light was really beautiful. If anybody's tried to shoot kinglets, they're probably one of the fastest moving songbirds to yep. begin with. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for these kinglets. And there was about five or six of them. They were feeding in, on the ridge. And finally, one popped up. This this songbird was probably at six to seven feet away, which is really close. Um, and the goal was to shoot it so that the, the head, the eye, the bill are all sharp, which this one is. And then I just wanted it to melt away after that. And so it's a different look for me. If you look at a lot of songbird pictures, you're, you're not gonna see a lot that looked like this. So when I share this and people see it, I think they, you know, it's a nice image, it, it does okay. But it's but what it means to me was weeks of work yeah. to get an image that exactly the way that I wanted it to look. I was thinking it was gonna be a warbler. Um, mostly I get black-throated greens up there in the fall. Um, in this case, it was a kinglet, which I was fine with, but it's my favorite kinglet picture that I've ever taken. But it just was more about the planning um, and kind of having a vision and repeating it over and over and over again until it eventually happened. And so for me, it's completely rewarding to get that result, knowing that this is pretty much exactly what I wanted. So that's, that's my story. Awesome. It's even more rewarding when you have to put in that much effort. Yeah. And sometimes it's one of those pictures. And I think we all have them where everybody else is like, yeah, that's a good picture. Yep. And you're like, no, 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 you, you don't get it, man. That's a, that's a great picture. It's exactly. exactly what I wanted. I put in so much work for that. Yep, for sure. So um, if nobody else likes it, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, Josh, got to hear about this uh, gannet. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks, Ray. Um, so these are northern gannets. Um, I actually travel with these decent. birds. They are. They're just fantastic. They're so charismatic. Um and they're just really, really cool seabirds. I actually made a special trip. I went up to northeastern Quebec. There's a, an island that these birds, there's a few breeding colonies in North America for gannets. I believe all of them are in Canada. There's none in the um, United States. So I went up to northeastern Quebec to this uh, small island. It's called Bonaventure Island. Um, it's off, off of the Gaspé Peninsula. 
The tough part about the uh, this particular shoot was you have to take a ferry to get onto the island. I think the ferry leaves around 8 a.m. So I got onto the island around 8.30, and it's about a 40-minute walk from where you get off the boat to the breeding colony. So, so just to be clear, you're not in a suit this time. Not in a suit, okay. believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> no wingtips. So I uh, trekked across the island, got there, and right when I got there, the light was already pretty harsh. It was sunny out. Uh, as and I was able to, you, you could stay at the colony from when you get there all the way, I think until four. So not ideal when it comes to golden light and, yeah. and the rest. So yeah. waited around and we found this spot. There was myself and a few other photographers. By the way, there's about a hundred thousand birds at this breeding colony, so you can't miss the colony when you come across wow. it. And it's got a very unique smell to it too, which um, Eh, is okay. So we're shooting these birds as they come in and it's, you know, the, the light was still pretty harsh. And then we just got very, very lucky. Um, some clouds came in and it created from some nice, soft, uh, diffused light, which is great for these white birds. And again, you've got the black primaries and, and the black feet. So I always think, you know, blacks look good in, in, in cloudy, uh, diffuse conditions. So um, we're shooting and all of a sudden the wind direction changed and I don't know why but a lot of folks didn't notice it and the birds weren't coming our way so I hightailed it to the other side of the colony where I had the uh, the wind in the proper direction and the birds just started coming toward me and I got I just laid down and I had a 100 to 400 mark II, the Canon lens I actually took this particular shot at 300 millimeters so that'll tell you how close I was these birds were just coming right on top of me and landing and it was awesome it was like a runway strip they were just coming in i took this with a 5 dsr too and that was what five frames a second yeah wow um so i kind of got lucky here and what i really liked about this shot you have these birds coming in they they come in with um seaweed grass some had feathers sticks their uh courtship materials for their mates is there this was in june so they were um starting the nesting process then uh, you could see this individual is coming in with grass, and you could see the other out of focus birds behind it coming in, which I really think make the image. It frames the bird nicely, um, and it just you know, it, you definitely know you're in an area where there's there's a lot of action and there's a lot going on. And again, the light was nice and diffused, and I, I thought it was great, um, and it was well worth the effort. And I got lucky. Uh, if the clouds didn't come in, I'm not sure how this would have turned out. Yeah, this light but, is uh, superb on this one. Yeah, thanks, Ray. It was definitely worth the trip. So, yeah, that's... awesome story. Thank you. No, Anna. Yep. All right. Let's see. Moving right along. All right. So I'm gonna wrap it up. This is the last one, guys. So uh, this story, this belted kingfisher. This is actually a juvenile. Uh, this story is actually about honestly years of preparation. So uh, this is a local private pond near me. Uh, where I live and um, at this point I think I had been living in this area for probably about I, I want to say probably six or seven years and since the first time I moved in I had been walking by this pond and noticed that there were always kingfishers around uh, but the it's a really small pond but it's completely surrounded by trees there's maybe one or two access points where you can actually get down to the water and see out and none of them were ever really near where a kingfisher was and if you're familiar with belted kingfishers at all you know these birds are generally very skittish really tough to get near so most every time I kind of wandered down by this pond to just see if there was any kingfisher activity all I would just hear was them laughing at, um, with their loud super loud call as they flew away um, so I realized after a few years they're coming back every single year they're always there and I it was it was finally time to do something about it so I realized there was no way I had tried countless times to sneak up um, to just pick a spot and kind of wait uh, but I never really put in a ton of effort trying to get these and and one summer I finally decided I'm going to put in that effort to get these. Uh, I had noticed over the years that there was one particular perch that they landed on semi-often and now that I've worked with these birds for a long time I really have learned that they really do have favorite perches. Uh, so in any case um, I decided to clear out a shooting lane along the edge of this pond so I found a spot that would be a good angle with good light and give me a clear shot to one of their favorite perches and I 
went in with some clippers and just trimmed some branches away so I could see right to this um, spot and then I cleared a little area where I could sit comfortably and get myself in a blind and that's what I did so I started getting in this blind and the first few times I went in I sat there for hours and hours and nothing and then I would have an adult show up and then uh, it would land there for a little bit and I'd take a shot and it would hear the shutter sound and it would go away but I just kept doing it. I kept trying and trying and trying. And eventually, uh, they got a little bit more used to me. They got more used to the shutter sound. And before I knew it, I was just photographing them like crazy, um, getting really frame-filling shots. And this particular shot of this juvenile is uh, the one, one particular year they actually, the kingfishers had the family there. So there was four kingfishers on this small pond at one time. So two adults and two of these juveniles flying around. And... This juvenile just had no fear, and while I was in the blind, it just flew right up to this stick. I mean, this is barely cropped, this image, and I just shot away. Uh, the There's a lovely little bit of sunlight, early morning sunlight, just hitting the bird here, but other than that, it's in the shade, and there's just nice light on it, nice clean background. The adult was actually sitting on a higher branch in the background that's completely out of frame, and then I think the other two of the pair were actually on the other side of the pond, so there was just an immense amount of kingfisher activity on this pond and anytime one of the adults would catch a fish or any kind of prey the juveniles would tear after the adult and just chase it down until they got fed it was really fun behavior to watch um, but I just wanted to tell this story because it was quite literally years in the making of me um, figuring out their behavior learning where they like to perch actually clearing out a spot and then countless hours sitting in a blind waiting for it to happen so um, you know, I hope you guys really all enjoyed all of these stories. That's the last one we got. Uh, thank you all so much for joining, and I want to throw out a big thanks to uh, all the photographers who were kind enough to set aside some time tonight and share these stories with you guys and send the photos over to me. So thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, if you guys want to say a quick goodbye and thanks, uh, that would be great. Thanks yeah. for tuning in, everybody. Yeah, yeah thanks. thanks, everybody. Yeah, perfect. Yep, I'll um, see you. I'll see you tomorrow, Ray. Yeah, definitely. I'll see you tomorrow, Scott. Um, guys, in the comments, let us know what you thought of this. If you guys really enjoyed this, maybe it's something we can do again down the road. And keep an eye out. We have some more concepts and ideas coming up. I think uh, Karam might be joining me on the next one in a week or two. So um, keep an eye out, and we'll keep the information on Facebook. And thanks again so much, everybody, for joining. Have a great night. Good night.